We're going to look at this little bit of brake system components and operation It's not going to take us all that long to go even though I've got about 80 or 90, 80 or 90 slides. Got really good fulcrum up here. You notice all the leverage you got. You're coming down to with this couple of thousand pounds of pressure. It's going out here and it's pinching the calipers with the brake pads up here. In the back, you're going to your wheel cylinders, uh, pushing out. And so your brake fluid bullet points here. Oh, this is 4.3. Uh, you got a, a newly opened can exceeds all minimum requirements. If you just leave the lid off the brake fluid can, it's going to absorb moisture. You got issues. You remember how I told you you could check and see if you got moisture in your brake fluid? Anybody done that worksheet? That's the little tab thing. Voltmeter. Well, that's actually the fast car system, you know, you know, fluid analysis by stimulation of copper alpha reactions or whatever it is. But anyway, we don't, if you take a voltmeter and you go to the negative side of the battery and dip it in the master cylinder, it's got more than three-tenths of a volt, you got too much moisture in your brake fluid. Got that. Uh, there's your dot three minimum. You dry, wet, dry, wet. Here we go. See with your 401, 284. 4.3 exceeds all that to 550. All right. So there's been reports of damage to seals when dot five fluid is mixed with dot three. Dot five fluid is the fluid with silicone in it. And if you're using that with any lock brakes, you're running a risk because it makes it whips it into a foam. You wind up with air in your brakes that seems to be there for no reason. So stay away from the dot five fluid. On the old car, like if you're driving a 64 Mustang or something, you want to preserve the rubber parts. You put you know the dot five in. I don't use dot five fluid brake systems down for dot three. These are warning, you know, some of your uh, worksheets ask you to find service warning, you know, uh, and stuff. Never reuse brake fluid after it's been bled from the brake system. You know, this, they don't want to put contaminants back in there. That's the long and short of that. Now right here in here, you got your master cylinder. I got some master cylinders you guys can take apart. You notice there's a bolt at the bottom of that where you're going to take it loose. Right, I mean, you take that loose, and I'll let you pull the secondary piston out. You got two pistons in there: primary piston, secondary piston. This is your reservoir. You got a fluid level sensor right here, typically, and you got your you got a front and rear split. You got a diagonal split. The way you bleed the brakes is going to be tied to what you got. Now, if you go to the shop manual and you read it, it tells you to bleed left rear, I mean, uh, right rear, left front, and then vice versa. You'll know you need to do it that way because if you don't, you won't ever get all the air out like on Gene's Frontier. After he had body work done, the, the brake pedal never felt right until we actually got it in here and we felt, I mean, we followed the shop manual procedure for bleeding it. All right, now this right here, if you get down and dirty with this, you got a compensating port up here that provides fluid to this pressure chamber. All right, whenever you move your, when this piston comes forward, uh, you basically are going to be, uh, you know, the fluid is going to be fluid. There's actually two sets of cups here, uh, but you're only seeing one of them here. When the brakes are released, you see how these, this rolls forward and lets the fluid go past it and all that. But whenever it's trapped, after it uh, gets past this port right here, uh, see, whenever you let this back, fluid's able to go into this pressure chamber and all that. But you've got to cover up the compensating port before you start providing pressure. Uh, be careful about understanding that. You're not really you're going to use that to fix any brakes. You just kind of need to know what's in there. You got your rotor disc, you got a brake drum, not a big deal. Make doggone sure, and I talk about this all the time, some of your calipers are floating on these little uh, polished pins. And uh, if you see a wedge-shaped brake pad wear, that typically means that your calipers aren't floating like they're supposed to, and you need to make sure they are. So always look at it. Don't just slam the pads on it without looking it over. What you're really supposed to do is you're supposed to clean all that up and make sure it works smooth. These little rubber boots, that they have around these things right here will typically work pretty well. Now, some of them, you just got the caliper sliding on flat abutments. And what you're supposed to do on those is make sure that you, you know, clean them and lubricate them so that the caliper can slide and float so that you don't have one pad. Like you may look at this, this outside pad and it may look just fine with your flashlight and the inside will maybe worn completely out because the caliper hasn't been floating and the piston has been shoving that one against the rotor until it's just about worn it out. And uh, anytime you see wedge worn pads or something like that, look for a caliper floating problem. Sometimes calipers stick and have to be replaced. That's all there is to it. I've got a caliper out here we take apart and put back together by blowing the piston out, putting the seal back in and all that. It's important that you kind of know what's down in the caliper 
but you're typically not going to rebuild calipers anymore. You're going to buy a $27 replacement caliper, put it on there, bleed it out. Another thing, whenever I used to want to mess with some of my students that thought they knew everything, I would take the calipers off the ranger and swap sides with them so the bleeder was on the bottom. And they would bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed the brakes and never get all the air out of them. But if you got a, if you see a caliper and the bleeder is not at the top of the piston chamber, it's on the bottom, that one goes on the other side of the car. If you got both the calipers off and you fool around and put them on the wrong side of the car, you could be worried for a while if you don't catch that. All right, right here you got a distorted O-ring as the piston's being applied, and that O-ring actually pulls back, pulls this back away from the, uh, you know, that pulls the pads back further than in full contact with the rotor. And that's, that actually is your spring. That rubber seal, this square cut rubber seal, is actually what acts as your spring. Now some rotors are internally vented, some are solid. Uh, the solid rotors are typically the ones you use the rubber band on whenever you're, you know, I'm talking about the little black rubber band, whenever you're doing the machining. Don't leave the black rubber band on there. And I have had one student that put a black rubber band on one of these kind and forgot to take it off and let the car out with the black rubber band covering up the vents. You know, that's not going to be good because the brakes are going to run too high. All right. Caliper is kind of like a C-clamp, basically like it is. I mean, you can see that, how that is. A moving caliper is like that. It's got to be able to move back and forth. Now, this is one of the back ones back here, the caliper integrated parking brake. Who did some of these the other day? Somebody in here did some of these the other day and had to screw that caliper piston back in when he did the rear brakes on something. Was that you? Some, or somebody did it. I can't remember. One of you guys did it. You had to screw it back in. You couldn't just push it back in. You had to get the tool, like we got in that kit, and screw it back in there. Um, and there's more than a few cars that are set up like this. Personally, I like this kind. I like the kind that's got the brakes in the hat. Now, if you're doing brakes on a Chevrolet pickup like this, one we got that y'all went and got your tools on a while ago. Uh, you always need to look at those park brakes. It'll be a one-piece park brake that you get another kit from the parks house to replace the park brake shoes while you're replacing them. Typically, these don't wear out a whole lot, but that's got a, it's got a hat in there. I don't really like that. Of course, you know, that's the axle coming out and all that. Okay, there's your actuating pins that are against them. You took one of these apart this morning. That wheel cylinder. That's looking more. You know what you're looking at now, don't you? Yes. I mean, because you took it apart and you had the parts in your hand, you understand what you're looking at. You take care of that after lunch, okay? You can do that thing. How long did it take you to do it? Two seconds. Sixteen minutes or something total by the time you're through. Wasn't a big deal. This is what you got. You got your cups. You got your spring. You got your piston, and they're pushing against that. All right. So now, everybody, look at this and burn it in. These are the ones like we got out there on the bench. This is a duo servo. This swings on the bottom, the adjuster's down here. You might notice on this one, the adjuster will be up here. It's difficult to see that adjuster, but if it's anchored on the top and the bottom, you got leading trailing. If it's basically just anchored at the top, that's the old servo brake. Now with your leading and trailing, the leading shoe makes contact with the drum, pulls against the leading shoe more tightly. See that? And the trailing shoe makes contact with the drum and rotation, and the drum forces the shoe away. So basically, it's that's not too hard to understand if you get right down to it. Uh, on your dual servo, the primary shoe is going to shove this longer. See, the short lining goes to the front on the dual servo. Always remember your short lining goes to the front. The rotation's that way, and this is going to shove that against this post, and that's going to give you most of your stopping force and all that. You got a neural pin on some of them, adjuster quadrant there. Uh, there's a couple of little wheels there. You can figure all that out. Uh, you might notice only. Uh, you might notice on the Oldsmobile, it's got an adjuster up here, but it's got leading trailing brake because they're anchored at the bottom of that top. All right, now right here, you're really familiar with this. Everybody that's done these brakes a lot of the times is going to know everything you're looking at right here. And except the difference is what you're seeing here is what's on the Bronco. You might notice that it's got a spring over here that's hooked to that, and then that cable comes around. That cable shares that little hole with the spring on the Bronco. It's slightly different than the ones out there because the ones out there are newer. And you got your adjusted screw. How many of you know what to do if the shoes are worn so deep into the drum that you can't get the drum off? What do you do with that? What you got to do is take a little pocket screwdriver. You got to go through the adjusting slot in the back of the, the back of the plate, and you got to push this away from that little wheel because that will this thing won't let that wheel turn backwards. So you got to push that away from the wheel, and then you got to use your brake spoon. While you got your screwdriver pushed in there, to uh, you know turn it backwards. 
might not be able to have to practice that on the table over there, you know. But uh, yeah, don't be surprised if you get ready to pull the brake drums off. Sometimes the brake drums get rusted around the hub and all that. A lot of these brake drums have got little eight millimeter holes where you screw a little couple of bolts in there to push that thing off, you know. You can still see those too. Um, on this one here, see that's another leading trailing with an adjuster up there at the very top, kind of like the old mobile's got. So if the old mobile doesn't use springs like this, it's got a big spring that wraps around here. And there's your trailing shoe that's in front of it right there. All right, now this is a brake booster. This is the cutaway of a brake booster. You might notice that the way this thing is, you got a master cylinder push rod that's adjustable. If you get it, if you get it adjusted out too much, your brakes won't release. That's a good thing. Front shell, diaphragm return spring, rear shell supported diaphragm. All right, all of this has got the same pressure in now. Now watch. Uh, this is the vacuum booster in the released position. What do you have all in here? Everything in here's got vacuum, right? Now this is actually upside down because that would ordinarily, ordinarily be going to the manifold vacuum. You know it's up here. But we just want you to look at it. All right, you see right here, this is what happens when you mash it. See how that actually shuts off the vacuum from back here? And now what you've got back here behind it is atmospheric pressure. And it comes in through here. Understand this well enough to where you can explain it if I ask you. One of the things after I've gone through this stuff, I don't want to come in here and ask you and have you say, I don't know. You know what I mean? Because you're, you're supposed to be learning this stuff. So atmospheric pressure is allowed to come in behind that diaphragm that helps you push the brake. How do you find out if your brake booster is bad or good? I would pump, the, pump it up until all of the vacuum was gone without the engine running. I'd put my foot on the brake, I'd crank it up and I'd see if the pedal goes down. If it does, it's okay. I will tell you something else that happens though. Sometimes you'll have a master cylinder that'll be leaking past the seals and it will fill this up with fluid in here. You may not see any external leaks, but people keep even adding fluid. Pull the master cylinder back away from there. Look down in here with a flashlight, because you'll be able to see in there on most of them. And if you see it's full of fluid, we had a Dodge truck out here he kept having to add fluid to, and we took the booster off and we poured a quart of fluid out of the booster. Be aware of that. All right, this one right here, see your atmospheric source going in there? We closed the vacuum port when we moved that forward and the, the vacuum can no longer get back here, but atmospheric pressure comes in. So basically the vacuum is not sucking it forward, the atmospheric pressure is pushing it. All right, this right here is going to be your uh, hydro boost power brakes. So you got your power steering valve, your steering piston, brake booster valve, brake booster piston, accumulator, power steering pumps providing all of that for that. All right, some of them have got a, a accumulator with nitrogen gas in it, usually that'll be like on uh, ABS, but these have that some too. The accumulator is going to provide you another uh, braking whenever you don't, you know, if you lose your power steering. Uh, they're not going to have, a, have the brakes where they're going to work without the engine running, you know, on more than about once or twice. But your extra braking that you usually have with your vacuum booster is mimicked by this accumulator, the way I've always understood that. Reserve system pressures in there, accumulator piston, uh, and then nitrogen gas in there is trapped where it can't go anywhere, and it provides like a almost like a spring. All right, this right here is going to be your metering valve and uh, proportioning valve stuff. Now, what we want to talk about here, metering valve equalizes hydraulic pressure on vehicles that use front disc and rear drum brakes. What we want to do with our metering valve is before we've applied the front brakes, we want to let the shoes come out and start touching the drums. And they just very gently begin to stop a little bit. That gives you more stability Right, as your rear brakes begin to stop, you don't want the rear brakes locking up before the front ones come into play. That's what the proportioning valve is about. It regulates brake force on the rear brake system. This one lets the rear brakes take up their slack and begin to stop, but it ain't going to let them go very far because the proportioning valve is going to prevent it from locking the rear wheels. What was I talking about the other day? You're going around a curve in a slide. You hit the brake because the deer runs across the road if it's raining, and if the rear brakes lock up, you're going into a spin, right? So we're trying to prevent that. We want most of the braking to be done in the front, because that's where all the weight is anyway. All right, and that's basically just giving you some verbiage of what I was talking about here. The rear brakes, uh, after the rear brakes have begun to apply pressure, is limited to the rear so the front can do most of the stopping. The proportioning valves on cars like that Oldsmobile have got little small thimble-looking proportioning valves that are in line with the rear brakes. 
Uh, you guys don't zone out on me now because you're going to need to remember this stuff. Proportioning valve and a metering valve are typically made together on a lot of them. Remember now, you're not going to have a metering valve if you've got disc brakes on the front and the rear. You understand that? Now, have you ever, how many of you have ever seen one of these? And what would be the purpose of it? Mr. looking at my phone, what are you doing? Sending text or something? Right there. What do you see? What's the purpose of that? Take a picture of it and send it to whoever you're texting. Say, I'm in class now. Don't text me anymore until I'm out of class. Okay? Got that? What is it? Somebody tell me. Don't sit there like a bunch of deadheads. Figure it out. Is it Read a, the words. A height sensing and brain proportioning Exactly. So why would we care about the height? Why do we even give a rip about the height? What happens whenever you put more weight in the trunk of the car? It lowers. Huh? Exactly. It gets lower. So it knows by the height that you've got more weight in the trunk of the car and it knows it needs to put more brake pressure to the rear because the rear is now heavier. You'll see this on pickups. You'll see it on, on, on I think my Taurus has got one. I mean, anytime somebody loads the trunk up, you're definitely going to have to have more brake pressure going to the back. Well, this is what Eddie was saying about huh? when Eddie was over here. Huh? When you heard yourself, Eddie came over and said that. Yeah, he was talking about that. Yeah. And that's what, that, that's what the height sensing torsion ground is all about. Now, this is basically looked at a, a little, you know, nice crisp cutaway of proportioning shuttle valve and all that. You know, this basically you're going to the right front outlet without ABS, with ABS. You know, so there's a lot of little differences on this kind of stuff. All right. Brake system testing and diagnosis. Don't inhale dust from brakes, clutches, or associated components because you will get mesothelioma, and that's like smoking 10,000 cigarettes, and it's not near as much fun. Really bad for your lungs. Don't go there. Always. The first semester I taught in here, there was a bunch of guys in here in their 40s that had been laid off from a cotton mill. There's like 12 students in here. And I says, never, never, never use the air hose to blow the brake dust out of the brakes. And one of them raised, the first thing he did is raised it up, pulled the pads off, and blew the dust out of the brakes. It's like I told him not to. I don't know what he was th thinking about. Well, then, then you run into somebody like that. Or I'll tell somebody, do not do this. And I'll stand there and watch them as they get ready to do that. What I told them, do not do, you know. Like, don't hook both the jumper cables together on this piece of metal, on this two-wheeler, because they will short out. Okay, and then he hooks them up, and they, what did you do that for? I just told you not to do that. Oh, oh, oh. You know, like he wasn't listening or something. looking at me, but he wasn't hearing it. Probably like some of you guys are doing. And said, maybe if he'll shut up in a minute, we can go to lunch, okay? All right, so let's go here. Here's another one. Compressed air or brushes must not be used to clean brakes, brake drums, or clutches, associated components. And they're talking about asbestos. All right, there you go. You've got a leaking power brake booster. Uh, that's pretty common. Uh, well, I say it is. I've seen it, you know, a fair number of times. It's not terribly common. But whenever you don't have power brakes, you know, you have to use a lot of leg power to stop the vehicle. Corroded or misjudged park brake cable. How many of you ever seen park brake cables that wouldn't release the rear brakes? You've seen that, right? It's nasty. Got to replace them park brake cables. Park brake, you got worn pad lines, clogged or leaking hose. Now, what if I told you I'd mash the brake? And the car would have needed initially pull, but the more I kept stopping, the more it came back to the front. You've got a clogged hose. Why does the hose clog? It clogs because yo-yos are letting the caliper hang from the hose. And it starts to tear on the inside, and then it starts to get clogged up. And you wind up with that. i got some gauges around there you can put between the pads and the rotors and see if you've got an equal amount of pressure at both sides. One of the gauges is going bad, but whatever, you know. Leaking master cylinder. If you hit your, put your foot on the brake, Initially, it feels good, and then the pedal falls from under you as you're sitting at the red light. That's a bad master cylinder. You know, the brake pedal push rod or turn spring, you got problems with that. Leaking wheel cylinders. Always pull a little boot back on your wheel cylinder to see if it's leaking when you're doing a rear brake job. Even if it looks dry, you see fluid on the inside of that brake uh, uh, wheel cylinder boot, you need to put a wheel cylinder on it. And you can have scored rotors, and everybody's seen this kind of stuff. Verify the concern. Apply the brakes under different conditions. Inspect for obvious signs of mechanical and electrical damage. If somebody comes in and they've got their brakes all haywired and they're all put together with crappy parts that somebody's cobbled together out of, you know, a can of bolts or something, don't let the vehicle out of there unless they let you put everything back like it's supposed to be. If they say put it back together, I don't want it that way, and they go and crash, then, then it's on you. It doesn't even matter if you got them to sign a release, it's still on you. So what do you do if they say, well, I'm not paying you to fix my brakes. You say, okay, fine. What we're going to do is we're going to put your vehicle out here 
on jack stands and the wrecker can come get it because it's not leaving here with the brakes like they are. Okay? I mean, you just can't afford to let somebody take, you know, put their baby car seat in the back with their kid in there and take off down the road with brakes they wouldn't let you fix. Because if you were the last one that worked on it, even if it was like that when it came in, it's on you. Be aware of that. Perform a road test to compare actual vehicle braking performance with a performance standard accepted by the driver. Everybody typically knows, although people have a tendency to work around. And this lady coming in, people come in here with absolutely nothing left of the rotor and the pads are jammed together. Sometimes they'll shoot out of there, the pads will. Uh, okay, you got a visual inspection chart, all of this stuff, what you're supposed to look at, you know about this, the stoplights, which is important too, by the way. I'm always talking about how if you've got a high mount stoplight, the one in the windshield, it doesn't work, they're 40% more likely to get rear-ended. And if you didn't catch that, they get rear-ended, it's 40% your fault. All right, tire air pressure, wheel alignment, brake pads, shoes and linings, components, and then you got your bearings and stuff on the ones that have bearings. Yeah, there you go. All right. All right. Or no one. The other one's laying over there on the bench, but I'll have to get it back to her. If I don't get it back to her, she can charge me for both of them, but I'll get it back to her later. All right. Okay. All right, let me see right here. Red brake light warning's always on. You got instrument cluster, circuit, park brake, brake fluid level. Remember when I told you about somebody heads off down the road with a red brake light on, and then it goes off after they've been driving a couple of miles? Typically low on brake fluid. It's heating the brake fluid up, expanding, picking it up, so the sensor's not touching the bottom, right? All right. Brake pedal goes down fast, fluid level, air and system, brake master cylinder, normal revs or ABS function. Be aware of that. If it eases down slowly, you got air in the system, master cylinder, normal revs or ABS function. If they lock up during a light pedal application, disc brake component, drum brake component, parking brake, you just need to be looking things over. You can usually pull all four wheels off of the brakes and tell. Remember when you guys put them brakes on the other day and the pads were able to click back and forth and she came back and said, well, I hit the brake up here and click, 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 click. Why do you suppose that pad was clicking? We, we machined the rotors and we machine the rotors on the faster speed and we sort of threaded them. So the brake pads were actually trying to follow those threads on that newly cut rotor. Now, he machined a rotor the other day on that slow setting and that thing was as smooth as a dinner plate. I mean, it was just as shiny and pretty. Remember that one that you did on the right side? Yeah. Boy, that, no. huh? doesn't come that way. That wasn't great, put that thing on, but it takes a long time, you know. If you're a smart guy, you'll start your you'll start your rotor turning, then you'll go work on the rest of your brakes. You won't stand here with your hands on your grip watching your brakes, you know. Uh, 150 pounds of force, 20% minimum reserve. You kind of look at pedal height, you can get an idea. Change in the pedal action or feel is often the first indication something may be wrong. Uh, so if the brakes don't feel good, somebody's talking about their brakes, how do they feel? They feel the same as they used to? Does it stop the way it used to? Are you hearing any strange sounds? Know which questions to ask. Well, sometimes your service rider may not know. A low pedal could be the result of the brake being out of adjustment, or it could indicate a system leak. Uh, power assist brakes usually have lower brake pedal height. It's going to go a little lower if you got power brakes. Just about every car's got power brakes nowadays. Uh, in other words, there should be 20% reserve pressure between the pedal's lowest point and the floor when performing that test. You got a maximum fluid level and minimum fluid level. That's not uh, rocket science. External leak test should be performed if the pedal's low. Once again, remember the master cylinder can leak and dump fluid in here, and you may not have any external leak out here at all. However, if you take your drum off and it's all greasy and wet, uh, then you may have either axle seal if it's a rear wheel drive, or you may have, and how do you tell the difference? How do you know? How do you know if it's brake fluid or if it's uh, axle grease? You know? Huh? So. Taste it. Brake fluid's got a taste to it. I ain't saying swallow it. Put it on your tongue, you'll know what it is. That's like antifreeze. If I see water on the ground and I want to know what it is, I want to know if this is air conditioner, evaporator, or antifreeze, I'm going to just touch it with my tongue. If it's sweet, I know that's not evaporator drink. Unless it's a heater core coming out there. But, uh, all right. You just got to make sure you spit a lot after you do it. Just. All right. If the reservoir empties but there's no external leak, probably maybe an external leak from master shoulder. Uh, it's, oh, by the way, if you also see a swollen cap, you know, the, the rubber under the cap is all swelled up, somebody's put oil in it. One of my students, who knew better, one time poured power steering fluid in the master cylinder on the Sonata. 
and we had to get it out of there real quick before it started to attack the rubber. He said, I don't know what I was thinking about, so I don't know what you're thinking about here. That same guy later on, and this is how I've had this happen with people that have done lots of brake jobs. For some strange reason, they'll be half thinking, and they'll put it on so that the metal part of the brake pad is towards the dadgum rotor. And the people will drive out of here like that, and then they'll come back, I'm hearing a terrible noise, and when you take it apart, it's the face palm. Oh, I can't believe this. And the guy that did it face palm worse than anybody. If you think a master cylinder is failing to return to the fully released position, you know, you got to be concerned about whatever else may be sticking up here causing that. Pump the brake pedal several times to eliminate vacuum. Depress the pedal with approximately 15 pounds of force. Start the engine. It ought to move now if it doesn't look at your vacuum source. Depending on the customer concern, some conditions may seem brake related but would not be. Right? Diagnosis of out of brake, non brake related concerns. Wheel alignment can cause brake pool. Wheel bearings can cause wheeling bearing. Can cause erratic pedal. Yeah, no, people outside the door. Yeah, no, we got people out there. Yeah. Uh, all right. So diagnosis of non-brake related concern. Tire inflation can cause pull. Road crown can cause pull. Tra traction lock problems can cause brake action to feel odd. All right. We'll do lesson four probably next time if I don't forget it. Anybody got any questions or comments?